All right. So what I'd like to talk about was a, a topic that I got interested in, and I'll tell you the story behind it in a minute. But the idea is that we, we think that now that we're shooting d- digital photos, they ought to last forever. And 300 years from now, our great, 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 great grandchildren are going to have all the photos that we take today. And the fact is that may not be true. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why. So let's first talk about the promise of digital photos. So this is what we used to have, photo albums. And this is what my parents grew up with. And it's what I grew up with. I'm old enough that we still had uh, regular photo albums. A lot of them were in black and white. And the nice thing about these photo albums is that everybody knew what they were. Everybody recognized them. And you were going to have these photo albums from generation to generation unless your house burned to the ground or got flooded. And so now uh, we've got a situation where burning to the ground or flooding supposedly isn't going to be a problem. Digital photos, which mostly came into popularity in the early 2000s, have lots of advantages. And I'm sure everybody in here knows what they are. They cost nothing. We can take thousands. I remember going on vacation and I'd go on a week long vacation and I had just a few rolls of film and I had to make those shots last throughout my vacation. Now I go on a on a week long vacation and I come back with literally potentially thousands of photos from my vacation. So we can take all the photos we want. They should last forever. They never smear, fade or tear. They're fantastic. But the downside, digital photos are intangible. And this is a sobering thought. Countless digital photos are lost every day. And we'll talk about how that happens and why. And most people don't know what they need to do to make sure that not only did they have their photos going forward, but their great grandchildren are going to have the photos as well. So I'd like to tell you a quick story about how I got interested in this. Um, about 20, my, my parents both grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and about 20 years ago, they took a vacation to Nashville, and my mom got the idea of stopping by the house where she grew up, and it's now occupied by a couple that at the time was about 30 years old, and they stopped in and they introduced themselves and explained that they were former owners of the house, and they swapped contact information, and a few years later, Uh, the owners of the house were doing renovations and they knocked down a wall or at least knocked down the drywall for a wall. And inside was a small set of dresser cabinets. And when they looked through them, they were full of old photos and, and keepsakes. And they contacted my parents and said, we've got all this stuff. And they boxed it up and sent it off to my parents. And what you see here is the actual box when it arrived and some of the photos that were inside that box that my parents never knew existed. And so I couldn't help but think at the time, if that happened today and they opened this set of drawers and there was all sorts of junk in it and buried somewhere in there was a floppy disk, would my parents ever have seen those photos? And Something that went along with that was I was looking through a computer magazine not long after that, and I found this quote, our family history ended the day we got a digital camera. And I thought about that, and digital photography gets us very focused on taking a wide number of pictures now and not really thinking about the future. And when we used to take pictures back 50 years ago, we thought about this as preserving memories far into the future. So what I wanna talk about today is I wanna talk about how to make sure that your digital photos survive, how to make sure they're identifiable, and how to make sure that people find them in the future, which is to say that your grandkids have your photos and know what they are. So let's talk about some of these things. So first of all, let's talk about making sure your photos survive. And the key to that is copies, copies, copies. And it's amazing, we've all been taught this. I'm sure everybody on this call has heard this, but we just don't do it. So a couple of tips here, your photos should never exist only in one place. And people do this all the time. Where are your photos? 
They're on my hard drive. Where else are they? Well, that's pretty much it. And the thing most people or many people don't take into account is that all hard drives will eventually fail. If you use a hard drive long enough, it will eventually go bad. It's just, uh, it's just playing the odds as to when that happens. And also, one of the things we forget about digital photos, and I've done this, is it's really easy to erase them accidentally. And I've absolutely done that. I meant to hit copy and I accidentally hit delete. And usually you can get them back, but that's the important thing. The important thing is copies, 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 so that if you erase photos in one place, you've got copies someplace else. I can't tell you how many people I've run into where their phones have the only copy that exists of photos. So they go on a vacation, they take lots and lots of pictures on their phone, which is fine. And that's what they use to show them to people. That's where they look at them when they wanna be reminded of their memories. But the next thing you know, the phone is gone. It's broken, it's lost, it's stolen, whatever. And there went all their photos. Can't tell you how many times that's happened. If you don't have this set up on your phone, one of the things you definitely need to do is back up your phone. There's lots of ways to do that automatically. Uh, I'm led to believe that iCloud will do that on an Apple. I've never owned an Apple iPhone, but I think that's pretty easy to do. On Android, uh, Android phones, Google Drive can back up your photos automatically. Microsoft One, OneDrive can back up your photos automatically. So there's lots of ways to do this. Just make sure you do it. So the other question is, what's actually going to survive? What can you put your photos on that 100 years from now, when your grandkids are looking for your photos, that stuff will still actually work? And there are so many different formats that have come along throughout the years that we just thought would always be here. I never thought when I was growing up that there would ever be a time when most people didn't have access to LP records. And I never thought VHS tapes would disappear. And they're, try going and try buying a VHS recorder or player right now. You can still find them, but it's not easy. Floppy disks, we thought they might get better, but I figured they'd be around forever. Nobody's got slide projectors anymore, or hardly anybody does. Nobody plays eight millimeter uh, movies. And you probably don't even recognize what that thing in the lower left-hand corner is that's a smart media card. They're entirely gone now. Nobody uses those anymore. I actually had cameras that use those instead of SD cards. So we have to give a little bit of thought to 30, 40, 50 years in the future. What are we using today that people will still be able to read and, and get photos off of? So some poor choices are, first of all, SD cards. SD cards are great. I love them. But believe, them, believe it or not, if you just leave an SD card sitting around, it goes bad. So if you store a whole bunch of photos on an SD card and you lock it away someplace, when you come back to it 10 years from now, there's a very good chance all those photos are going to be gone, or at least many of them will. Flash drives have exactly the same pro uh, problem. I love flash drives, but they will go bad just sitting around. And then there's the problem with obsolete technologies. We never thought diskettes would disappear, but they're unusable today. So what should you use to store photos permanently? Well, I'll give you a couple of options. The first one, believe it or not, I believe is CDs and DVDs. And I've done a lot of research into this. And even though many, many people no longer have CD or DVD players in their computers, the fact is they're still very widespread and there's so much stuff recorded on CDs and DVDs that it's pretty unlikely that in, at least in the near future, and I'm talking about the next 20, 30 years, you won't be able to find a CD drive or a DVD player if you want one. So some tips on that is don't use rewritable discs. They don't last long-term and Blu-ray discs are not common enough for me to want to use that as a permanent storage mechanism. So if you find CDs and DVDs that are labeled as CDR, DVDR, either plus or minus, those are good. The ones over on the right-hand side of that chart are not good choices. So 
If you're going to use a CD or a DVD for permanent storage, what can go wrong with that? What can happen to a DVD or a CD that can cause it to go bad over time? Well, CDs are actually made with aluminum. Most of them are made with aluminum. And over time, that aluminum can corrode. Now, the aluminum is inside the CD, but what happens over time is oxygen seeps into the plastic and can eventually get to the aluminum, aluminum and cause it to corrode. Also, there's dyes used in the CD and DVD, and those can degrade over time. And of course, there's physical damage. You always have to worry about your dog is gonna step on the CD and damage it, or something physically is gonna to happen to the DVD. So I'll give you some tips on that. If you're gonna store stuff long-term, there's something that most people have never heard of, and it's called an archival DVD. And these are DVDs that are specifically made to have stuff recorded on them and then to last for a long, long time. And the way they do this is that instead of using aluminum inside the DVD, they use gold. And the reason they do that is because if gold is exposed to oxygen, it doesn't degrade. So even if oxygen manages to, manages to seep through the plastic and get at the gold, it's not going to affect the gold. For the dyes, they use long, special, expensive, long-lasting dyes that won't degrade like they do in regular DVDs and CDs. And the result is that we believe these DVDs can last for over 100 years. So if you record things on these archival DVDs and archival CDs, then as long as somebody can find a player, the DVDs likely to be good well into your great, great grandchildren's lifetime. So this is a very good way to back stuff up. They're a little pricey. Here's the brand that I use, and we actually use this, these at my office. We have to store medical records for 25 years after we see a patient. And so uh, we'll take the medical records and we'll record them onto these archival DVDs and then store those. And so we use verbatim Ultra Life Gold archival DVDs. They're a little pricey. So this box of five is almost $14 from B&H Photo. They're surprisingly hard to find on Amazon right now, but you can still find them at lots of other places. So this is certainly not what you'd wanna use for your everyday stuff, but if you wanna keep something for a long time, this is a good way to record it. So some tips on how to make sure that DVDs that you record last a long time. Store them in a cool, dark, dry place. Moisture and light are the enemy of these guys. Store them in a plastic case, as you see here, and label the cases, but this is important, don't write on the discs themselves. Most inks have acid in them that can seep through and damage the internal components of the DVD, the internal surfaces. So I don't even trust the pens that claim that they're acceptable for writing on discs. So put the disc in there and stick a paper label on the outside of the case and make sure that the disc isn't actually written on. And don't stick labels onto the DVDs themselves. Again, the glues in the labels can degrade and cause problems with the, uh, with the DVD. So abuse the case all you want, but uh, don't stick or write anything on the, on the DVD itself. And my experience has been buy a brand name that you know and trust. I'm all for, when I'm just recording, stuff that I don't care to, whether it lasts into the future. I'm all for buying off-label, off-brand products. But when it comes to CDs and DVDs that you really want to last, there's no substitute for manufacturers that you recognize. So there's a list of the manufacturers you can typically trust. Then there are others, but when it's a Chinese name that you don't recognize, don't count on that lasting. So again, make copies. Um, and that's the nice thing about these DVDs. The archival ones are a little on the expensive side, but you can still make lots of copies, send them to friends, keep them elsewhere. What I do is I back up my photos once a year and I take copies and put them in my desk drawer at work. That way, if my house burns to the ground, I've got lots to worry about, but at least I don't have to worry about losing my photos. They're safe on a DVD that's stuck in my desk drawer at work. So that's always a good 
good choice. If you've never burned DVDs before, never created them, if you have the drive, there's free software out there. This is what I use. It's from a company called A Shampoo, and they put out a free product called Burning Studio. Uh, there's a paid version as well, but the free version works just fine. It's just that when you're done burning a DVD, it nags you to buy the, the paid version, but, but it works great. I use it all the time. The other option for storing stuff permanently is magnetic hard drives. And these are expected, if you take care of them, to also last a long time. So I have several of these external hard drives and I back up everything on my computer to them once a week. And as long as the drive doesn't get damaged, I have pretty good confidence that these will last into the future. Some important tips, we're talking about magnetic hard drives, not SSDs. As much as I love SSDs in my PC and in my laptop, they're not appropriate for long-term storage. They will go bad after a period of time. By reliable brand names, I use Western Digital. There's also Seagate. There's other brand names. Again, if you see some Chinese knockoff brand name hard drive, it's not likely to last. Um, choose the lower capacities. So it turns out that the really high capacity drives will not sometimes last as long. They're not quite as reliable as the lower capacity drives. So right now, if I were gonna store something and I really wanted it to last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I would definitely look for a one terabyte drive as opposed to a four terabyte drive or even an eight terabyte drive they've got today. You wanna stay away from the latest technology. It's not as well proven as some of the technology that's a few years old store in a cool, dry place. And, and this is important. You want to spin up the drive occasionally. And what I mean by that is just plug it into a PC or a laptop. You don't have to access anything, but you want to make sure the motor doesn't freeze up. So just plug it into a laptop, let it spin up, leave it that way for about five minutes, and maybe do that once a year. If you're not planning on recording anything new onto the hard drive, if it's just something you've, it's full of photos and you want to save it, just make sure it gets spun up every once in a while. Once a year is plenty. So one of the techniques I've heard and I've started doing this is what I call the New Year's tradition. So every year while I'm watching the Rose Bowl parade or, or whatever else I'm doing for New Year's, I just copy all my DVDs that have got photos backed up on them. And usually I'll send copies to friends and family so that I know that there's copies out there that aren't in my house. I take all my backup hard drives. If there's any I haven't used in the past year, I plug them in and let them spin up and make sure that the motors are still in good working order. And, and again, send copies to friends and family. And that's just something I've got on my calendar for every New Year's. And interestingly, I heard uh, Judy Taylor, one of the APCUG people, mentioned that she got in the habit of doing this and she and I'd never discussed it. it. It's not like she told me or I told her, but we both have exactly the same tradition on New Year's Day. So that's pretty cool. Some other ways to store copies. I'm a big fan of online services. I have all my photos stored up on various online services. Great for sharing photos. It's great. It's a great place to have a backup. But, and this is a mistake a lot of people make, don't ever count on an online service as your only storage for your photos. You need to always have copies someplace else. Some of these online services have gone out of business very suddenly. There was one called Photobug that went out of service, uh, that, that went, um, the, yeah, that, that died and closed up shop. Um, Google had a product called Picasa, and they, they still have a product called Google Photos, but if you stored all your stuff on Picasa, that's gone now. So it's important that online services be a backup, but not the only place you have your stuff stored. One of the interesting ways to make sure your photos are backed up, your really important ones, is simply to print them. This is really effective. At least if you lose your digital copies, you've got printed copies. So the question is, how long do these photos last if you print copies? Well, it depends and nobody really knows. So I saw a quote in a, a magazine a while back and 
guy named Richard Sealing said, in 2050 or 100 years, we'll know what really worked and what didn't. But until then, all we can do is guess. So modern photo printers haven't been around that long. We really don't know how long photos, printed photos last. But here's the best guess I could find. If you have photos professionally printed, they should last about 40 years before they fade. Inkjet photos under ideal circumstances can last as long as 75 years. That's really interesting to me. This was a big shock that professionally printed pr photos won't last as long as the photos you print on your printer under ideal circumstances. However, most people don't print them under ideal circumstances. And actually most photos that people are printing will last less than five years before they start to fade. So how do you get those ideal circumstances? Well, first of all, get a good printer. The ones you buy at Walmart for $39 are not good printers. Find a highly rated, reviewed uh, printer that's gotten really good reviews, and that's gonna cost you a little more money. You might pay a couple hundred dollars for a really nice printer. Use the manufacturer's ink if you're gonna print photos that you really want to last. Now, I like third-party ink as much as anybody. I've got a laser printer that uses toner cartridges that were dirt cheap. I've got an inkjet printer that uses third-party ink that's really, really cheap. But the unfortunate fact is that that third-party ink does not last as long, does not wear as long as well as the manufacturer's ink does. And I know it, it pains me as well to go pay $60 for a set of Canon ink cartridges, but the fact is they're the ones that are gonna make prints that last. You also wanna use premium photo paper. That costs a little bit too, but when you can buy 100 sheets of photo paper for $5, that stuff is not gonna last. Keep your photos out of direct sunlight. And if you do display them, if you don't wanna keep them out of sunlight, if you wanna put them up on your wall, actually mounting them under glass will help them survive. It blocks some of the UV and they'll last much longer. So let's talk about how to make sure your photos are identified. Now in the old days, what did we do with photos? We wrote on the back of them. I've got lots and lots of photos that my grandparents and parents took. And on the back of the photo is the date and the place that it was taken and who's in the photo. And, but the, the issue that we're gonna have in the future, your grandkids are hopefully gonna be looking at some of your digital photos and they're gonna have no idea who this is a photo of. If it's you or it's your spouse, they'll know who it is, but your great aunt Martha, they're just gonna say, oh, well, it's some old person. I've got no idea who that is. So how do you make sure that when people have your photos, how, do you, how are they gonna know who the photos are on? And let me tell you, as I've gotten older, I've watched my memory get a little bit weaker. And sometimes I look at these photos and I don't remember who these people are. So here's what, you, here's what I do. First of all, I organize my photos into directories that have meaningful names. So when I take photos and I put them on my PC, the name of the directory has the date and the time, the date and where it was taken. And so really give some thought to how you're gonna organize the folders on your computer. Don't just dump all your photos into one great big folder and assume that at some point in the future, you'll remember what those photos are of. And then in each one of those directories, and I know this is a little bit of work, I create a text file and I write in the text file what the different photos are and who is in the photo. And I think that's really important. Just create a plain text file. I don't use Word documents because I'm worried that 40 years from now, Word may have changed their format enough that if I create a Word document, nobody can read it. Nobody's got a version of Word that can open that file anymore. And don't use photo organizing software to identify who's in your photo and what, it's a, what the photo is of. I actually used to use Picasa for this. Picasa had a great little feature in it. Uh, it was a piece of software that you could use to organize your photos. I used to use this all the time and I'd put, you know, who was in the photo and where it was taken and I'd put all kinds of information in. 
And then Google bought Picasa and killed it. So all of that information that I put in there is no longer accessible to me. So nothing beats just a text file that has descriptions of your photos in, in it. And finally, how do you make sure your photos are found? I talked about the box, the dresser drawer and the photos that were in it. As, as soon as those people opened that dresser drawer and saw the photos, they knew exactly what it was. Everybody recognizes a box of photos. How are we going to make sure that somebody recognizes and finds the photos that you're taking now? So digital photos don't stand out like that box of photos did. And photos that are stored on your computer's hard drive are really easy to lose. So imagine that um, your, your great aunt passes away and she's got a computer. Are people really going to look through every corner of her hard drive to try to find all the photos she left behind? So this is re it's really important that where we stick photos may not be places that people are going to look when we're not around to tell them where our photos are. And individual CDs and memory cards are really easy to miss. So let me give you some tips to make sure that the photos you're taking today are accessible to other people. So put CDs, DVDs, and hard drives of photos with your important papers. So we, my, my wife and I have a book that's got our will in it and our power of attorneys and all that sort of stuff. And I got some DVD organizers to stick in the back of it. And DVDs of all my photos are stuck in there as well. And on the DVD organizers, it's clearly written photos and videos. And so somebody who finds that notebook is going to know that that's what those are. Tell people where your photos and videos are. And this is especially important if you have kids. Make sure they know better, better, make sure that they actually have copies of it. But if they don't have copies, make sure they know where you're storing your photos and videos. Hopefully, they'll be interested in retrieving them. And if you have DVDs, label the cases, not the DVDs themselves. We talked about that. Don't write on, CVD, on the CDs and DVDs. And the important thing is make sure people realize what they found. If somebody is going through your effects when you're no longer around, make sure that they don't throw out a memory card or a flash drive or a DVD because they don't realize what's on it. And here's what I did. This will make absolutely sure that people know what they find. Create a photo book. So you can do this really inexpensively. Create a photo that's got maybe 30, 40, whatever, whatever you can manage, 30 or 40 of your favorite all-time photos, and then put a DVD backup of all your photos in the back of the book. And put a note in the post-it note in the front of the book that says, DVDs in the back have a backup of all my photos. And somebody's going to find that book. They're going to look through all the photos and they're going to realize what it is they found. You can get these books made really inexpensively. Here's a list of some of the places that I've either heard of or used. I've actually used most of these. And if you watch for a group on coupon, you can get some of these photo books made for as little as $10 plus shipping. They look beautiful and you can just pick some of your favorite photos, get a nice glossy photo book made, and then stick the DVDs and some DVD organizers in the back of the book. If you want to save a little bit of money, you can just get a photo album and print the photos yourself, stick them in the photo album, and then put the DVDs in the back of the book. If you use hard drives to back up your stuff, like we talked about the external hard drives, then put the external hard drive someplace safe, do the photo book, but in the photo book, put some sheets, glue some sheets in there that say, I've got external hard drives, they're in the third cabinet in the living room, and those external hard drives have got backups of these photos and all my other photos. And an idea that I really like and I've kind of become this for my family, is the idea of a family archivist. It's somebody that's devoted to making sure that the photo, that not only your own photos, but the photos of other people in your family 
also survive. So a family archivist contacts members of the family occasionally and say, have you got any photos that I need to have copies of that you haven't already sent me? Have you taken any photos this year that I ought to have? And I back them up onto my own hard drive and I make sure there's DVDs, I make sure there's online copies, I make sure everybody's photos are backed up. So if my cousin calls me and says, I had a hard drive crash and I don't have copies of my videos, I can say, that's okay, I do. I have a copy of everything, at least that since you sent me since the beginning of the year. And you can also make these photos available to everybody. So you might put them up on Google Drive or OneDrive and let your entire family know that those photos are available. You make sure lots of copies exist. And I also make fresh copies. So I take all my DVDs and every couple of years, at least, I duplicate all of them so that I don't have DV, I, I don't have in my collection just DVDs that are 10 years old. I've got 10 year old DVDs, but I've also got some that were made last year. And that way I know that there'll always be some good DVDs in there. And also the family archivist hopefully is somebody that's interested in technology and so watches for format changes. So when floppy disks went out of style, maybe I had everything backed up to floppy disks and maybe my Aunt Martha doesn't know that floppy disks are hard to find now but I would know and I would make sure that I now have copies on other media and not just floppy disks. So my conclusion is that uh, digital photos are probably the best thing that ever happened to photography. The idea is that a uh, hundred years from now, your family can have beautiful, brilliant, colorful photos that are as crisp and perfect as the day they were taken, unlike my great grandparents where the only thing I have are faded and damaged uh, photos that don't look anything like they did at the time and didn't look that even that great at the time. You can have beautiful, beautiful photos as long as they don't get lost and as long as people know where they are and as long as people can find them. So if you follow some of the tips that I've given you here, hopefully your great, great, great grandchildren will have access to the same digital photos that you're taking today. So thanks very much. I hope you got something useful out of that. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, very informative presentation. I do have a couple questions that uh, were posted in the chat box. Sure. One is, I'm not familiar with uh, this um, uh, media, MDIS. Uh, they claim to have uh, a thousand years or longer. Do you know what an M disk is? And uh, no, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I'll tell you what. If you'll, uh, I know you're going to send me an email with other questions after the presentation. If you'll make sure that one's in there, I'll look into it. Okay. And the other one, uh, you touched on this, but uh, this individual said they thought that DVD uh, weren't uh, the best. That I was better to use CDs. What are your thoughts on that? Um, th there was certainly a time when I would have agreed wholeheartedly with that because the the pits and CDs are much larger. And so it, it takes a lot more damage to a CD for, um, for you not to be able to record the information. The problem these days is archival CDs um, are, are a little bit harder to find. And so... I'd rather you use archival media than regular CDs. So the archival DVDs are a lot easier to find. And also the, the issue with CDs is that the surface that the data is recorded on is actually the front of the CD. And if it gets scratched, you can actually permanently damage the CD. Whereas in a DVD, the recordable media is actually sandwiched in between two layers of plastic. And so there's no place on the DVD where, where a minor scratch is going to uh, ruin the whole DVD. So there actually are some advantages to DVDs and the recording media has gotten so good and the readers and writers have gotten so good that I don't really worry about the difference between CDs and DVDs anymore. And speaking of archive.
I'm sorry, at least for me, you broke up there. DVDs for $95 today for a 50 pack, pack spindle. I'm sorry, That's say a, I, I, B &H, I missed B&H photos. <clears throat> okay, are they actually archival DVDs? That's what he says. They're on special day for $95 for a 50 pack. That that is an absolutely fabulous deal. The only thing I would caution about is make sure it's a brand name that you've actually heard of. Um, I, I think some of the overseas uh, media that's created, they call it archival, but I don't really expect it to last. So if it's TDK or Memorex or Maxell or Verbatim or some um, brand name that you've heard of, then that's a great deal on them. Right. And B and H, I believe, is a big uh, store in New York, and you can they're on the web, so you can go and and look for that if uh, you're interested in taking uh, advantage of that deal. Another question I have is: Can uh, you give any information about copying old photos to preserve? Suggest good printers uh, that you can use to uh, copy. Well, so some of the all-in-one printers are probably about the best you can do, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I know it costs a little bit of money, but I've had fantastic luck with some of these services that will do uh, scanning and convert to, to digital. And if you watch for a, a Groupon coupon, they can be great deals. We sent thousands of our old photos off to some of these people and got really, really nice uh, digital photos back. Uh, you they typically will try to upsell you on the higher resolution, which I actually paid for. And it can get just a tad expensive when you do that. But I'm so pleased with the results. And so uh, now I've got digital photos of, of my old photos and I can print all I want. And um, that I think that's the way to go. And Mark, I remember uh, some time ago that it was either Epson or Canon was uh, promoting their archival inks. inks. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Uh, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any experience with those specifically, but um, my guess would be that it's probably a better ink, um, and, and <laughs> I'm sure they charge way more than it justifies. But if you want to make sure it lasts, it's probably going to do you some good, I would imagine. Can you possibly write something carefully in small letters with a very fine Sharpie uh, on the inner ring of an archival DVD so that you can be able to identify it somehow? Yeah, probably. So there's a clear ring on the inside of CDs. And which doesn't actually have any recording media on it. And if you write on that very carefully, I would imagine that's completely safe. Uh, I usually want to put more details than I can possibly write on that, though. I might want to put a list of the things that are on the DVD. You know, these are all my vacations from these dates to these dates and includes pictures of these people. And so my usual way of doing that is I take a piece of paper or, or I print a piece of paper that is the size of the DVD cover. And I just use a glue stick and glue it onto the cover. And that, that just seems to work really well. Do you have a uh, preference for what software you use to view your photos? <laughs> yeah. And, and all the ones I really like are not being supported anymore. Um, there's a, there's a number of good ones. There's a, a fast stone viewer is what I'm using right now. And I like that probably as good as any of them there. Um, God, there, there used to be one called ACD, ACDC viewer. And the, the C at the end was spelled S E E. And I loved it. And it's just gotten terrible in later years. The, the problem is I want a photo viewer that loads really quickly and they've all gotten so bloated and they include editing software now that uh, they take a long time to load. So Irfan View is good. Uh, Fastone Viewer is good. There's one, I think it's called XN View uh, is, is not bad. So I use Fastone Viewer right now, but I don't know that 
I don't know that it's the best. It's just what I use. I think you did mention this, but I will repeat the question. Why no mention of pres pers I'm sorry, um, preservation in the cloud, such as Google Photos, et cetera? I think that's great and, and absolutely use that. I, I just don't trust it as my only copy. That's all. So uh, I use OneDrive, Microsoft OneDrive. I really love it. Um, many, many of my photos are up. On, I don't back up everything there, but um, I also use online backup services like Carbonite and Backblaze and iDrive. Uh, those are absolutely fantastic. Highly recommend them. I've got a presentation on them, by the way. Um, so I really, really like all of those. Um, I just don't recommend, you know, you never know when they're going to have a hard drive issue. Uh, you're trusting them to keep your files safe. So just don't make it the only place you keep this stuff. That's all. But it's a great other place to keep photos. And then uh, for legacy purposes, if something should happen to you, uh, you need to have a password to get into those uh, cloud uh, storage files. So you have to have that written somewhere where someone can find it. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and the way I handle that is, um, so my best friend and my, my, he was the best man at my wedding, is a physician. And so he's used to how to protect electronic documents. And, and I trust him with anything. Um, he's also my doctor, by the way, which is a little weird, your best friend being your doctor, but we make it work. Uh, and so every year, that's one of the things I do every year is I print out a list from my password manager of all my passwords, and I give him an electronic copy of it, and he keeps it with all the other stuff that he has to be very careful to protect. And uh, another question, this is interesting. Uh, what about using the photos metadata for the photos description, and will that data be able to uh, be it Will you be able to read that data in the future? Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually had a slide on that. And I think maybe if you download the, uh, the version that I turned into um, APCUG to make available to you, that slide might actually still be in there. And I just took it out because I was afraid of running out of time. So that's called the EXIF data, E-X-I-F. And I like it a lot. Uh, the only thing I'm concerned about it's, it's a great way for those of you that aren't familiar with it. The JPEG uh, photo format actually has the ability and Windows and Apple have the ability to store that data, title and comments and when it was taken and what f-stop you used in the camera and all of that data can get stored with the photo itself. It's actually part of the image file. And I really love it and I use it all the time. I do have concerns that uh, my wife, for example, wouldn't know how to get at that data. And so I don't trust that as the only place that I would store that data. That's all. And another suggestion here, instead of a text file, uh, why not rename the photo with the identifying info? Yeah, I love that. If you want to do that, that's fine. Um, you might, uh, that, that's actually great. What it, what it can do, the only negative to that is um, when someone pulls up a file listing and it's in order by the name of the file, that won't be the chr chronological name in which you took the photo. But maybe if you give the, the files names like 0001 and then something meaningful, you know, 0001 Aunt Martha on her 90th birthday. Uh, that's great technique. I, I love that idea. Uh, the text file is nice if you run out of room because I don't like files that have, you know, 500 character names. So if I can put a name that's meaningful, that's great. If you want to give more information than you can reasonably fit in the file name, that's where a text file can be useful. Um, can you uh, recommend a good program to make a copy of a 
uh, DVD to digital for saving on your computer? I think you did mention a couple. Yeah, so if you're going from the DVD to your computer, you can usually just copy the files. Uh, it's when you go the other way that you need special software to do it. And I like the, I'll put it in the chat when we're done. Um, I like a shampoo just because um, it's, it's what I've used. It's pretty easy to use and there's a free version. So I, I like it. it. It has ads in it, but that's okay. It's easy to use. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, another comment is uh, uh, metadata for JPEGs, but what about PNG and other formats? But they all, I believe they all have the same information. I think they, I think they do too. Uh, I, I've never used the metadata in a PNG, so I hate to say absolutely that it has it, but PNG is a much newer file format very hard for me to believe that there would have been a capability in JPEG that they didn't put in PNG as well. Oh, this is an interesting question. Uh, wondering if I could use Microfish storage. Uh, seems some stable, seem more stable than DVD dies over 20 years. Microfish would not require high technology to read hundreds of years from now. Is that service still available? Yeah, I never thought about that. I know there are still places that have microfiche. There's so much information on it. I think that'll be around for a long time to come. Um, I, I don't know what the image quality is like on microfiche, though. So I, I don't know if it would do justice to your photos. But now, we, it's interesting. We used to use it to uh, archive uh, reports and things when we had those huge printouts. Uh, and I hadn't heard that term in years. Yeah, me neither. It's an interesting idea. <laughs> okay, this is a uh, this will be our last question, but it's a good one. Uh, what do you see um, any uh, new technology that's coming on the horizon that may be useful? What's your thoughts of that? You know, I I don't know. I I imagine there'll be something coming down the pike. Um, you know, the emphasis these days is on flash memory, so it's always possible that they'll come up with a kind of um, flash memory that's stable over a long period of time. That's the problem with flash drives and SD cards and SSDs, that they all use flash memory that's just not stable over the long term. Uh, and by long term, I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years. You know, it's fine for five or six years. Um, so that's a possibility. But, you know, there's no question there'll be some sort of new memory coming down the pike. I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, but there'll definitely be something that's stable over a long period of time. We'll just have to wait and see what it is. I agree. Technology is constantly changing. So uh, it's always uh, interesting to see what uh, the future holds.